responsibility, come up and have a discussion. Well, thank you so much, Eric. It's such an uh, honor uh, to be at a uh, Red State Gathering. Real pleasure for um, us as Texans to have uh, so many of our friends from around the, around the nation uh, come to the Lone Star State. You know, I would note that there are some really nice real estate agents uh, running around. You're more than welcome to stay. Y'all are welcome to stay. Um, a lot of us have begun to adopt, though, the mindset that maybe we do need to build a wall at our borders, generally on our western border, to keep the Californians from coming in. Um, but otherwise, uh, except for some of you, some of you are quite okay. How many folks uh, here this morning uh, with us for breakfast are from Texas? How many Texans do we have? Outstanding. Um, Patricia, how many, uh, how many people from the part of the country I like to refer to as not Texas are, are with us? Okay, great. Well, good. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for, for joining us. I know last night we had a great time with uh, Senator Cruz enjoying margaritas at Garcia's, and so we're all needing an extra cup of coffee this morning. Uh, we will provide, hopefully, a little bit of an extra jolt for you to, uh, to get your day going as we talk about uh, what uh, Eric Erickson referred to at the beginning, this problem of balkanization within the conservative movement. This balkanization is driven by the establishment who really doesn't want fiscal conservatives and social conservatives getting along. Jim Graham, who you'll be hearing from in a few minutes, um, has started referring to what happens in our state legislatures as the Las Vegas syndrome. A lot of our members of the legislature head off to Austin, Texas, or they head off to your state capitol, and they hope that what happens there stays there. And they really want to make sure that when the, when the homeschoolers show up, that the homeschoolers see something bad going on fiscally, and they don't run off and tell the fiscal conservatives. And that when the, you know, the tax cut crowd shows up and they see something going, on, going wrong on the life issue, that they don't go tell the pro-lifers. They want to keep all of us in our little balkanized boxes. We began speaking over the past year or so, Jim Graham and Joanne Fleming and Kathy Adams and Tim Lambert, some of those of you from Texas, those are familiar names to you. And we started comparing notes, notes about who was standing in the way of pro-life reforms. And I'd say, but, but, but those guys are the ones standing in the way of, of fiscal reforms. And then Tim Lambert would pop up and say, but, but those are the people standing in the way of homeschool reforms. And we started saying, oh, we sh we're seeing a pattern here. And so we started this Life, Liberty, and Property Coalition, Life, Liberty, and Property Tour that travels the state, talking about the reforms that have been left undone in the great state of Texas, the conservative reforms that should have been no-brainers for a Republican-controlled legislature and a Republican-controlled government, but have been left undone because the establishment, sadly, is bipartisan when it comes to taking down conservative reforms. So what I've asked, um, you know, we've, let me back up and note that we, are, we, we fall into this balkanization trap because many of us like to think of ourselves as the Lone Ranger. And sadly, the Lone Ranger who killed Tonto four, four miles back. You know, that's how a lot of us in the movement feel. A lot of us just want to be the one riding on the right ho white horse that saves the day. The reality is you can be much more effective when you work in an army. An army can do a lot more than a Lone Ranger can. And there's safety in numbers, quite honestly, and I'll talk more about that at the end. And so we have started this uh, habit of whenever we travel, we travel with our rowdy friends. And um, I'm uh, honored to have with me uh, uh, two of my rowdiest friends, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, you will in a moment be hearing from Jim Graham. He is the president and, and the executive director of Texas Right to Life, the oldest, uh, most established pro-life group in the Lone Star State. Uh, Jim also sits on the board of directors of National Right to Life. Sitting next to Jim, and you're going to hear from first, is Joanne Fleming. Joanne Fleming is the head of Grassroots America, We the People, one of the most uh, influential of the citizen activist groups in the Lone Star State. Joanne Fleming also serves as the uh, chairman for the past several years of the Citizen Advisory Board to the Tea Party Caucus of the Texas Legislature. If you notice that she's occasionally having to pop pills to keep from twitching, it's because of that job. <laughs> 
Joanne Fleming has also served uh, in an elected office, giving her particular insight to the way elected officials do and don't think. Um, Joanne Fleming served uh, for two terms as a county commissioner in Smith County, Tyler, uh, Texas. She self-limited her term uh, mainly so she could restore some semblance of sanity. And uh, we're going to start with Joanne Fleming talking to us a little bit about the insanity that has plagued our state's budget. Thank you so much, Michael, and let me vouch for Michael Quinn Sullivan. Michael Quinn Sullivan, uh, unlike some of the legislators uh, on, on the, uh, both the right and the left, who are the big government people in our state capitol, you know, they'd like for you to believe that Michael Quinn Sullivan eats small children for breakfast and kicks puppies and pulls wings off of butterflies, but he does not. He is my friend, and I'm, I'm very proud to be associated with Michael Quentin Sullivan. Thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome today. I'm so happy to be here to talk to you all uh, at this very early breakfast meeting. And I want to tell you a few things about Texas that you might not know. First of all, the state of Texas spends too much, and it borrows too much, and it depends way too much on the federal government to balance its budget. You probably have never heard people say that because you're used to people telling you that in the great state of Texas, one thing we don't do is we don't spend all the money. Well, yes, we do. For example, last session, our legislature, by the time they finished uh, their supplemental spending and passing a budget, did you know that the state of Texas, when you compared spending, in this past legislative session for our biennium budget to the previous biennium spending, it grew at a rate of 26%. 26%. And so shocking was this that even the Wall Street Journal wrote an editorial that says, Texas goes Sacramento. And it kind of disturbed some of our officials, statewide officials even, and they began to challenge us on our math. Well, let me tell you something. There's one thing that this group knows very well, and we know how to do the math, Michael. And so that's part of what we've been doing, is telling people that the state of Texas spends too much. So let's talk about it. Did the legislature just sort of get up on the wrong side of the bed last session? Did they sort of just swerve into doing the wrong thing? Did they have an accident? No, not really. Because if you look at the historical spending increases for the last 20 years, you will see that Texas in its all funds spending and let me pause here a minute. Why is it important to look at how much a state spends in all funds? Because all the funds they have came from we the people. That's why. Whether it is money that they skim off the top of sales tax that they get from the local government, or whether it is out of your state pocket, your state taxpayer pocket, or whether it's your federal funds, those funds came out of somebody's pocket. So it's important to look at all funds spending. So if you look at all funds spending for the last 20 years, you will see the state of Texas had an increase of over 300% in spending. Well, we're a big state. We've had a lot of population growth. We've had some inflation in that period of time. So how much was that? Well, the combined rate of inflation and population growth for that same 20 years is about 139%. So here we go with some of this high math. 300% increase in spending is a heck of a lot more than the combined rate of population growth and inflation of 139%. So what does that mean to us in Texas? Texas has a spending problem. And that's what the Life, Liberty, and Property Tour is about, is to tell the people of Texas that Texas, the state government, must get our budget shoved back inside a constitution-sized box. That means that spending is limited. Now, what about the state of Texas and its uh, debt? 
Well, the state debt portion, we lead the nation in transportation debt. And in fact, we have more state debt than the U.S. Postal Service has debt. That kind of puts it in perspective. Then if you look at our dependency on the federal government, did you know that the state of Texas is 11th in the nation in dependency on federal funds to balance our budget? 11th in the nation. Why does this even matter? Because we believe that all of the constitutional conservative groups in Texas, if there's one thing we agree on, it is that the state of Texas needs to be strong. For Texas to be strong, we need to have limited government, limited spending, spending taxpayer dollars only on those things that are its core constitutional functions, not spending money on corporate welfare projects throwing away transportation dollars instead of focusing on highway projects, spending it on light rail and trolley car boondoggles. The state of Texas needs to be less dependent on the federal government. Is there anybody in the House this morning that believes that Washington, D.C. is going to get its act together anytime soon and stop the profligate spending in Washington? Anybody? Okay, that means I am in the right room. <laughs> but let me tell you, as conservatives, constitutional conservatives, we face three big enemies. Big government, big business, and big media. So that's why we need all of you to carry the message of what is actually true about what is going on in the state of Texas. If there was ever a time that we all need to be focused on supporting elected officials who are going to fight for our life, our liberty, and our property, it is now. And it is also essential that we elect people to office who know something about the United States Constitution. There is nothing more frustrating than trying to sit down with politicians and ask them to fight for Texas, particularly with the, this border crisis going on, and they don't have the vaguest idea as to how Texas should stand up and protect its own sovereignty. But I am asking you all who live outside of Texas to encourage your conservative leaders to do what we've done. Because it has made a big difference. More and more as people understand the truth, the distance between what politicians tell you and what they actually do, the people know how to make the right choices at the ballot box. And then after you elect them, if they don't do the right thing, I believe in firing fast. The longer they stay, the worse they'll get. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed being here. Today is August 9th, and on the Catholic Church calendar, a woman named Edith Stein is remembered. Edith Stein was born in Poland a Jew and through the study of philosophy, converted to Catholicism, joined a convent, a Carmel, and with Hitler, she was moved to Holland to try and hide her from the Nazis. But the Nazis would eventually find Edith, they would take her to Auschwitz, and they would gas her. And she was killed in the gas chamber in 1942. Why I say that is that is the perfect example of what happens when the state has all power. That is the logical conclusion of a government that is not based on principle but on power. There is a war going on in America between those of principle and those of power. Those of power think we live in a Hobbesian jungle where it's a natural war of every man against every man and law is purely arbitrary to keep the peace. Verse, the people are founding fathers who believe in God 
and a relational God who set up a proper order and that our laws are based on the law of nature and nature's God. In fact, Thomas Jefferson said, the care of human life and its happiness is the first and only legitimate object of government. The care of human life. So there is a war going on right now, and it's a fundamental rule. One side ends up in the gas chamber, one side ends up in the proper development of society and the creation of a situation where every person can contribute to society based on the talents that God has given them. Now, those of power, sadly, in many ways, control the Texas government. Every year in Texas, there are 70,000 abortions. 70,000 completely innocent children are killed every year. In fact, that's, well, that's, what is that? That's Temple. City of Temple is wiped out every year. Flower Mound, Conroe, Harlingen, Victoria. Pick a city, all 70,000. Just think about that. Every year, if we took every person in Temple, put them in a train, took them to Auschwitz, and killed them, that's what's happening every year in Texas. And we're told to not think about that. In fact, two years ago, I was dragged into the State Affairs Committee and told, you got your sonogram bill two years ago. Basically, that's going to be it. Stand down. Get back on the plantation. Now, that's the way people of power think. You and I, it bothers us that there are train load and car loads headed to the extermination camps. That bothers us, and if it doesn't, it really should. So passing one pro-life bill every two years should bother us. There are states, Alabama, Oklahoma, and the like, that pass five, seven pro-life bills. In fact, let's talk about it. The Republicans hold a supermajority in the House and the Senate. And do you know how many pro-life, pro-God, pro-family, pro-religious liberty, pro-gun bills were passed by the House last session? Supermajority, come on, take a guess. Zero. The reddest of the red states, the most pro-family, pro-God, pro-gun state, couldn't pass one bill during the legislative session. I guess what matters, money? That's all, that's all we can do in our legislature, is pay attention to money? And Joanne just demonstrated that there's no fiscal restraint there either. So what we have to decide is, is what is truly important? And are we going to engage? There is a war going on, and we have to start paying attention. We have to get involved. We were made for combat. We are not to simply grow fat on the land and enjoy it. We are each given unique talents by God for this exact moment in time to make a difference. And we have the possibility to make a difference, and as Joanne alluded to it, in the last legislative session, actually in the last two primaries, we took out one Republican incumbent, Jeff Wentworth, and then in the last election cycle, we took out two Republican state senators, Bob Dole and Corona, two of the most liberal members of the state Senate. There are probably no other states in America that did that took out two extremely powerful Senate candidates waging million-dollar campaigns, and it's because all of us banded together, the fiscal conservatives, the social conservatives, the homeschoolers, the Tea Party people, and we worked for a united cause. And we demonstrated to ourselves, to our state government, and hopefully increasingly to the entire nation, that when we get together and work together, Tremendous change can be made. And the people that we're electing and replacing these rhinos with, they will be good not only on the human life issues, but they'll be good on the social issues. They'll be good on the homeschooling issues. They'll be good on guns, religious liberty, and everything. So we do not have to believe that we are all in the boxcars headed for the extermination camps and there's no way off that train. 
But if we don't say anything or don't do anything, that is where that train is headed. So we are called to combat. We must engage the system. And what's great about the whole Wendy Davis experiment is we realized that if we fight, we can win. And we have learned that we can fight and we can win, but we have to be smart about it and we have to put our whole heart and soul into the matter. And so the future can be very bright, but the determination is ours. And so I'm glad that you've joined us tonight and I hope you will learn from the Texas experiment that when we work together, we can win. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Joanne. For those of you who live in the glorious, beautiful 56 other states, um, <laughs> let, me, let me encourage you that, that when you go home tonight, tomorrow, if you're foolish enough to leave, um, when you get home, track down your state's pro-life group that exists. Track down the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the taxpayer groups and the Tea Party groups and encourage them to work together. Because a lot of times, and as the leaders of organizations, we can tell you, we're not, we as these organization people, we're not trained to think, we're not encouraged to think in coalition unless we're in charge of it. And so they need to be prodded by you as their, as their members, as their friends, as their fellow, whatever state you're from Ian's, to do, to do this sort of thing, to band together, because there is true strength in numbers. For those of you who live in Texas, those of you who are blessed, um, we would encourage you to join alongside us, your organization, small hometown group, um, or larger state group that's not involved. We'd love to have you and your group involved. We'll also, we also have a way coming up for everyone to engage. We're going to start having on, the, on every Tuesday of the legislative session what we're calling First Amendment Tuesdays, where we're going to uh, have a conference room there in, uh, at a hotel near the Capitol. We're going to do a little bit of training on how to be an effective citizen leader. And then we're going to let you know what's on the docket for that week and then encourage you to go out and knock on doors. Now, when I say First Amendment, a number of you thought freedom of speech. Some of you thought freedom of press. Some of you might have thought about freedom of religion. I would suggest to you there is another freedom in the First Amendment that we forget about. The freedom to petition our government. We have to begin doing far more peti uh, petitioning of our government. You and I have to be speaking louder. I like to note that with elected officials, you should speak slowly, with small words, and very loudly. You also should probably use a big chief tablet and crayon when writing to them to make sure you effectively communicate a message. All right? Whether you're from Texas or you're from not Texas, though, I would suggest to you that you also have to uh, gird yourself for the battle. A historic fact is that the people of the 13 colonies were no more free on the fifth day of July, 1776, than they were on the third day of July, 1776. Yes, they declared something on the fourth, but it meant nothing until there had been a fair amount of fighting. And I would suggest to you that as you begin speaking more loudly, more directly, and more effectively, you will find fighting. You will be assaulted. The establishment really doesn't like it when we show up with a bright light and shine it in the dark places. And they will start taking shots at that light. Many of our states have, many of your states have, what we have in Texas. These little obscure agencies that were started in the late 80s and early 90s for the purpose of doing ethics or elections. And we don't pay attention to them. Over the past couple of years, we've focused on the efforts of the Federal Elections Commission and the Internal Revenue Service to try to silence conservative voices. And we've all been very much distracted by Lois Lerner and her profanity. 
I would suggest to you that we cannot allow ourselves to be deluded in thinking that even if Senator Cruz and our other good warriors, and there are some in Washington, D.C., are successful in shutting down that speech oppression, that, it's, that, the, that the problem is solved. Because in Texas and in the other states, we have these small, appointed regulatory bodies that are seeking to silence conservatives. Indeed, it's not just regulatory bodies doing it through regulatory actions, though. Last year, the Texas legislature, the reddest of the red states, the conservative of if, ist, I guess, of the conservative states, our state legislature, with legislation introduced by Republicans, pushed through a measure that would have required every nonprofit in the state of Texas to disclose to the state the names of all their donors if they did something that some incumbent politician thought might be, you know, make them too uncomfortable. That's what Lois Lerner was trying to do at the IRS, what the FEC is trying to do. Now, oh, I said every nonprofit. That wasn't exactly true. I apologize. Because they specifically excluded labor unions. Specifically excluded labor unions. And this is in Texas. Fortunately, the governor of Texas vetoed the legislation. And he vetoed it for all the right reasons, noting that this would chill First Amendment rights, noting it would chill the freedom of association, the freedom of speech. One of our more problematic presidents on issues of individual liberty was Andrew Jackson. But Andrew Jackson, as he was leaving office, and I'd like to think maybe he'd started to realize the weight and the gravity of some of the things that he had done. He exhorted his countrymen in saying be as, uh, that we must be eternally vigilant, vigilant, that was his phrase, eternally vigilant when it comes to matters of liberty. But he said it behooves you to be as watchful in your states as in the federal government for attacks. Now, I'd suggest to you that you and I can't take our eye as citizen leaders off the ball when it comes to attacks to our First Amendment liberties. For those of you in Texas, I encourage you to visit any one of our websites, but especially LifeLibertyTexas.com. LifeLibertyTexas.com. That's where you can keep track of not only the tour that we're doing around the Lone Star State, um, uh, the, the combined stabs of our organizations are furiously making sure that each one of us put 30, 40, 50,000 miles on our cars over the next couple of months traveling the Lone Star State. And that's also where you can get more information about the First Amendment Tuesdays. Please, 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 speak up, speak louder, and speak in a unified voice. We as conservatives can't be lone rangers, but we can make one heck of an amazing army. At this point, we're happy to answer any questions you might have about the way, uh, the way we've organized this or about some of the specific issues here in Texas that relate to both elections and policy. Questions? Yes, sir. You know, again, you, a lot of times we think of things as Republican and Democrat. Let's remember that the real fight is not Republican and Democrat, it's establishment versus the rest of us. It's, it's the ruling elite. Um, and, the, and the press gets confused because here you're in a Republican-controlled state, but you've got us criticizing the big spending, and they're worried because you're not, you know, they want to spend even more. The press is, Joanne, why don't you take a, take a stab at that? Well, I find that, and that's a very good question, thank you. Uh, I find that the only thing that they've taken a little delight in is that we've begun to talk about corporate welfare. And, um, you know, we put it in terms of if you don't like for Washington to pick winners and losers in your economy, if you don't believe that the national economy should be centrally planned because that fall, flies in the face of free markets, then you shouldn't like it in your state either because there's no principle of liberty on which you can rest 
uh, or support corporate welfare and crony capitalism. So that is the one issue that they've seemed to agree with us on. Uh, but, but it all comes down to the spending, Michael, because uh, I find that big media likes uh, big business and big government to all be in bed together so they can all spend more because after all that you know that that makes you feel good and it's uh, I find that the liberal philosophy is all about feelings and I submit to you that uh, decisions that you make on spending other people's money should not be based on tradition nor feelings but on need and constitutional authority. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the question for those who may not be able to, uh, to, to, to hear um, is a question related to the leadership of the Texas legislature, the Texas House of Representatives specifically. Again, we have a two-third, almost two-thirds of uh, both our House and Senate are comprised of Republicans, you know, guys who go out and campaign as conservatives, but we get slightly different results. Um, and she asked a question about our, the Speaker of the Texas House, a fellow by the name of Joe Strauss affable fellow, you'd love to have a cocktail with him, he's, you know, very pleasant, he's raised in a country club and all that wonderful stuff. Um, you know, Jim, why don't you take a, take a stab at uh, answering the question of how do you, how do we go about changing leadership of the uh, Texas House of Representatives? Clearly, uh, Mr. Strauss, who had an award from NARL, um, his uh, uh, spouse is on the uh, board, has been on the past on the board of Planned Parenthood. Um, how do we go about changing that dynamic of, of leadership? Well, the first way to change a situation is you have to become aware of it. And one of our biggest problems is just as when C-SPAN went into Washington in 1994, we began to see what the cockroaches were really doing when we shine the light on them. That's when you started identifying Dan, Rosti, Rosti, Rinkowski, the house banking scandal, all these things. So we became aware of them. Why we banded together is because people don't know what happens in Austin. All of our elected officials come before us and say, I'm pro-God, pro-life, pro-family, pro-homeschooling, low-small government. And then they run off to Austin and work against us. They kill bills in committees where there are no fingerprints, and then they come back after passing absolutely nothing that we want and say, I'm pro-God, pro-family, pro-life, pro-gun, and boy, I wish I could have helped you, but nothing happened. So the first thing is we've got to let people know, and that's why we have banded together, and we're touring the state so that we provide the truth that you're not receiving, whether it's from the elected officials, from the Republican Party, and certainly not from the media, which has a vested interest in the status quo and the power structure. So one, become educated, and then two, the actual votes. And it's something that you need to ask your own representatives. You know, who are you supporting and why? There's already one candidate running against the speaker and that will be the first day of the session, correct? And so that will be maybe the most important vote. But the bigger issue is, are you all paying attention? And you're going to have to really engage because all of our groups have probably gotten as far as we can without additional help from the people. People have got to take their government back and go to Austin and let their representatives know that this is our government, our state, and we are engaged. Yeah, and I would note that you heard yesterday from that declared candidate for speaker, uh, Scott Turner from, uh, from up here in the Dallas area. I would encourage you to visit his website to, uh, to support him. Some of you might be surprised, and including many of you here in Texas, might be surprised to know that up until four years ago, it was illegal for citizens to be engaged in the speakership discussions. It was illegal, it was, a, it was against the law, if you can believe that. And for 40 years, we all kind of went along with it. About five years ago, Kelly Shackelford and a group Liberty, uh, Liberty Institute 
uh, fought a legal battle to make sure that all of us could participate in the question of leadership. Um, so we have to exercise our rights or else we might find, themselves, find ourselves with another 40 years of being shut out of the process. The lobby in Austin doesn't want a change in leadership. They like the spig keep the spigot going of taxpayer dollars, which Joe Strauss and his cronies have, uh, have allowed to continue. So um, the speakership race is critical. I encourage, if, you have, if you're from Texas and you haven't spoken to your state representative about it, you should. And here's a quick at a talking point. Our state senate, as alluded to by Jim Graham, is going to be a far more conservative place, full of strong, reform-minded fiscal and social conservatives. Uh, our new lieutenant governor, a very strong uh, fiscal and social conservative, coming in to the uh, coming into the fray. A state young state representative from over in Dallas County, Republican. Uh, was recently uh, lecturing a group, um, a group of citizens, telling them that, ah, oh, we got to keep Joe Strauss because we don't want those slash and burn Republicans, his phrase, uh, his description, uh, to, uh, to, to, ha to carry the day, and that Joe Strauss will make sure none of those reforms get through because Joe Strauss can kill them with his committee assignment. <coughs> Uh, so if you, if you need a little added, added <coughs> incentive or added talking point, suggest to your state representative that yeah, not only will he have trouble in his own race, but he's going to have a state senator who's going to be blaming that state representative for not getting things done uh, coming in, uh, after the next session. Yes, sir. For, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I thought I'm feeling better because we do exactly what you're talking about in Pennsylvania. We do have one ad addition, which you didn't mention at your beginning. We have big labor. The labor unions in Pennsylvania are probably the single most powerful political group. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting because you're kind of giving me a different spin on Rick Perry. But my question really is to Mr. Graham in the pro-life. What, what I found in Pennsylvania, we have a county, Lancaster County, every, every elected representative is pro-life, solidly pro-life. They're also big spenders. And when I go to the electorate, they say, well, you know, uh, uh, Gordon Denlinger, he's uh, is pro-life. And that's the end of the conversation. I said, but you know, but he's spending. We just passed a seven, it's a, over five years, we're going to spend $7.5 billion on a new transportation tax. It is the single largest transportation tax in Pennsylvania history. It's the largest tax increase in 20 years. Every pro-life, pro-lifer from Lancaster County voted for it. On the other hand, Every fiscal conservative in Pennsylvania is also a social conservative. Every single one of them. There is no such thing as a, a, a socially liberal and fiscal conservative. But my question is, how do I find the Jim Grahams in Pennsylvania? I mean, you're on National Right to Life. I'm sure that there's representatives in Pennsylvania. They don't, it's like there's a, a stone wall between you and Ms. Graham. And, I'd like to find out how you bridge that. What do I say? How do I, how do, how do I explain that, we're on the, that we should be on the same side? Well, I think you have to simply begin the conversation. Our bond began by me starting to go to Michael's meetings. He has a Wednesday meeting during the legislative session. And as I sat there with the different, primarily fiscal conservative groups, I realized their enemies they were talking about the same people that all thwarted yeah. the pro-life, the pro-family legislation. And so then I tried to really make an effort to start getting all my social conservatives to start coming to the meeting. And we started talking and working more together. And I think it's something that it's a slow process. It has to be done organically. But I do think it can be done. And Mike Chikichopo, who is there in Pennsylvania, is a fantastic man. And well, I, I might disagree with you on it. To what be honest, needs to be done. To be honest with you, I might disagree with you on that. Okay. Uh, but but uh, because when we had the Arlen Specter Pat Toomey race, he somehow convinced people that Arlen Specter was pro-life. You know, Arlen Specter was not pro-life. But. Um, but that, but that, if, if it's going to be organic, I mean, the, the point what you're standing there in, in real life is showing me that it can be done, which I didn't, frankly, until now, didn't think it could be done. I thought you were over here and they were over there. And well, I think one thing that our, we are learning in the pro-life movement and we're learning in the fiscal movement is that we are not here to be slaves to the Republican Party. Yes. And 
and we, most of us are Christians. And because we're Christians, we're principled. And because we're principled, we vote for those who share our principles. And right now, for the most part, those tend to be Republicans, at least according to their platform. But we will no longer simply embrace and endorse people who have an R after their name. We are starting to hold people far more accountable. And everyone tells us, oh, yes, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-family, pro-God, pro-gun. That's easy. But now it's, OK, what are you doing about it? Why are you that way? What are you actually doing? Who are you supporting? It's not just saying that. And we are being far more rigorous in our endorsement policies, in the viability of the candidacy policy. And I think we have to be far tougher on our candidates. And if we are tougher at the beginning, our job will be much easier as the session goes on. And Thank you. you know, there are a lot of folks who suffer from the Stockholm syndrome when it comes to you know, <laughs> working in public policy. You know, where we all kind of hunker down, we're used to being kind of beaten about the head and shoulders. We take our, our you know, little bowl of, of gruel and our you know, rotten piece of bread, and we say, oh, thank you, sir. And we forget that we are supposed to be in charge. You know, we are the leaders of our country. They're our servants. And you know, we often kind of say, oh, well, you're supposed to represent us. But then we don't act like it. You know, and kudos to, to Jim Graham and Texas Right to Life specifically. When, when, when I realize, you know, I've always you know, pro-life issues is what drives me being a fiscal conservative, but it's when I saw the leadership of the Texas legislature saying, you know, we don't need to do any more pro-life stuff. And I saw Jim Graham and his team double down and say, oh yeah? Well, we're going to demand even more then. I thought, well, that's exactly what we should do. That's exactly the tactic. We shouldn't let ourselves be relegated to some plantation in Jim's words, we are in charge, not them. And Thank you. encouraging our folks to break that, that syndrome. And yes, Michael, let me question. just oh, add on that yes. pro-life bill, because this is my favorite part for Joanne, <laughs> is the Texas legislature right now across the state, they're doing this. They're going, oh, wow, look at this powerful pro-life bill we just passed. The fact of the matter is Governor Perry forced that down them by threatening that he would keep calling them back till 2020 <laughs> if they didn't pass that bill because they had successfully killed all pro-life legislation. But now they're all campaigning on this one bill, but they're saying, don't look at the fiscal stuff, don't look at the homeschooling stuff, because you got nothing over there. Look at this bill, which was forced by Governor Perry. So just remember that when they come in front of you, try to use this to establish the raison d'etre to be your leader, <laughs> that that bill was passed not because of their volition, but in spite of right. leadership's efforts. Yes, ma'am. Last Brent, question, thank you. Yeah. Brenda Hampton from Austin, Texas. So uh, my question is on the fiscal side, and that is, have you done kind of analysis of what they have been spending on and the increase in spending to determine if there is some spending that's being done based on need versus spending being done for other reasons. Have you got kind of a, a breakdown? And I don't need to, the details now, but I'm just wondering how you looked at it besides just the, yeah, it's more than what we think it should be. Sure. I would encourage you to take a look at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. They've done a great review of the, um, of the state budget and the way spending has happened. Um, I think that's where um, we need to uh, begin looking at a lot, with a lot of great resources. Uh, Joanne, do you have a one-minute answer for us? Uh, yes, and as Michael said, Texas Public Policy Foundation's website um, is where you go because we're in a coalition, the conservative budget coalition, and then the real Texas budget. We actually have a list of, of items that they can uh, offload and stop spending money on those things. Um, so if you would um, get from some of somebody here uh, my contact information, or you'll see me down here as, as Eric gets us off the stage, uh, I, I will be happy to give you that website and give you those documents, okay? That's a very good question. Thank you. All right, thanks.